Welcome to Post Doom, regenerative conversations exploring overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. I'm Michael Dowd, your host. And in this conversation, recorded in October of 2019, I speak with four people who have become dear friends and colleagues as a result of their work in Seminary of the Wild. Their website is seminaryofthewild.com. I met them, uh, they invited me to be a speaker along with Brian McLaren and and Richard Rohr and others uh, at uh, the Ghost Ranch, New Mexico uh, for their Seminary of the Wild training. And Victoria, Matt, Brian, and Brian uh, all bring a deep wisdom, a green wisdom, a wisdom of ecology and right relationship to reality as well as ministry and psychology. And they integrate it in an extraordinary way. And I think you'll find this conversation interesting. And I think you'll find the Seminary of the Wild to be quite something to check out. Why don't each of you just do a check-in? I want to hear how things are going for you each individually. <laughs> I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm, uh, I started at a new congregation. Um, and so it's, it's been uh, <clears throat> drinking out of a fire hose, kind of, you know, getting settled in and and remind me where each of you are, because I think I know, but I don't remember exactly. Yeah, so so I'm in Denver. I'm in the Lakewood kind of area of Denver, um, and uh, but but you know we've we've been meeting pretty consistently with Seminary of the Wild plans and chatting about the year long and all sorts of other things. So you know I feel very busy, but busy with really good things and then some things that I wish I wasn't so busy with uh, <laughs> and envy the the your situation oftentimes as well so that's that's what I'm up to these days either Brian I think for me I, I, I guess I'm gonna uh, just share how I'm sort of observing myself recently in the last few months maybe since I heard you in July but you know, one snapshot, I was at a presbytery meeting recently uh, for four hours and um, halfway through it, I just found this sense of what the hell are we doing in this meeting? Like none of it was about stuff that really matters. And I, I'm finding myself more sort of the word agitated, um, like a sense of priority, like what really matters, I guess it's really sharpening for me. Um, I share with the other uh, with my seminary wild folks yesterday. I've also been just told I need to have a biopsy for my prostate. My dad had prostate cancer, and a blood test came back that said I probably got at least a 25% chance. So, so just the word. You know, I know you went through a cancer thing, Michael, a big one. Um, it's not at that point for me, of course, but but I think that just helped to sharpen it more too. Like I really want to make sure I'm about the stuff that matters. And um, yeah. so each day I'm sort of more aware of what feels in that zone or what feels out of that zone and how can I maybe make adjustments? You made a huge adjustment with your living situation, the way you're living, but, but I feel like I can make adjustments each day. Like what am I willing to spend my time doing and what am I no, lo no longer willing to do? Um, so it's just kind of all that stuff sort of deepening, I guess. And uh, it feels good. It feels like I'm being led by a, a deep place of guidance. Um, I'm still in the Detroit area. Vic, Brian? Pop in there, if that's all right, Vic. Go for it. I think that I'm feeling something, I think what Brian said is also very similar to me in terms of, it's almost every day I think, how then shall I live? Mm. And it, uh, it's not something I was trained to do. You know, you're kind of indoctrinated to do something and not think about it. Um, but maybe at midlife you think about it more. And as a parent, you maybe think about it a little more. But in this kind of uh, cultural and ecological climate, it's, uh, I think about it all the time. Partly I'm sick of the culture we live in, really sick of it, even though it's allowed me to become who I am in a certain way. Um, and I also get related to what each of you said, I get really frustrated when someone says about climate change, oh, someone will figure it out. <laughs> it's like, it's like passing the buck for me. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard to uh -huh. kind of listen to and to um, 
know how to respond actually that's both um compassionate but also leads them forward or maybe fierce it doesn't alienate something like that those are tricky conversations i have with lots of people close to me. um you know it just makes me so sad right now i'm not even angry all of the you know yay greta your generation gives us um hope you know that's what they used to say to my son um mm. and it makes me just so so irresponsible and alec used to have a thing in his presentation that was like larry king said like literally you know they say this will happen in 50 years who cares what happens in 50 years you know yes, exactly. and he's like yeah you don't care because you'll be dead like we won't be and do you seriously not care about your own grandchildren yeah, yeah so how to break past that compassion block like it, it, it's like a i was listening to one of your other uh podcasts with steven um mm -hmm. yeah yeah and just how he, um, I, I, my emotions are taking over my brain. So uh, I forgot what I was going to say about Stephen, but um, just how, how we, ca we can't process this. So we don't, you know, and, and it like, like I just go and I just found the therapist that can actually speak my language and because, because I'll, you know, it's like, I feel this emptiness and this dread. And it's not just about me and my parents and whatever, like typical therapy. Yeah. It's, it's mm. so much bigger than that. And we don't have ways to process it. And, oh, I know what he said. It was just like, we like shortcut, even, even those of us who get it, you know, it's like, we are those folks we're talking to, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to survive the day and, and we just yeah. want to go okay well how do I get through even the post doom idea like how do I get through to to uh, you know the other side quicker you know how do I get to resurrection hurry hurry, hurry you know <laughs> let's get past this death part it's uncomfortable you know like it doesn't work that way <laughs> Vic Matt Brian Brian it's a joy to have you here on this particular series because the last time that we were together was at one of the most awesome places in North America uh, Ghost Ranch and I was there at your invitation and Brian McLaren was also there to really introduce a concept I wasn't aware of until maybe six months prior to that when you sent me the invitation which is Seminary of the Wild and uh, Ghost Ranch, of course, is a place that uh, is world-renowned for its beauty and its spiritual energy and whatever. So um, it's, uh, it's a delight to invite you to be a part of this post-Doom series, because we sure I, I sure gave you a plenty dose of Doom and post-Doom when we were there. So if each of you could just take a minute or so, introduce yourself, and then sort of introduce us to Seminary of the Wild. Uh, I'm Matt Sirdal. I'm a pastor in, in Denver, Colorado in the Presbyterian Church USA. I'm also founder of Church of Lost Walls and one of the co-founders here of, of Seminary of the Wild. Great. That is. Thanks. My name is Brian, my name is Brian Smith. Sorry. No. My name is Brian Smith. I also serve as a pastor of the Presbyterian Church. I've been doing that for 31 years. I'm living in the Detroit area. I've been here for 27 years. I'm also a certified clergy coach and have uh, practiced trying to help uh, spiritual leaders uh, make transitions in their lives. And I'm also a co-founder of Seminary of the Wild. Sweet. I am Victoria Lures. I'm a uh, been a pastor for about 25 years and a spiritual director and. Um, and about five years ago, left indoor churches for good <laughs> and uh, started the Church of the Wild in Southern California and now doing the same in Bellingham, Washington. Also uh, founded, co-founded and lead the uh, Wild Church Network, which is a bunch of folks from a bunch of different denominations who have also left churches, uh, buildings and, and to worship God directly in the natural world and um, and also a co-founder of the Seminary of the Wild. That's great. Thanks.
I'm Brian Stafford. I'm uh, too irreverent to be a reverend. Uh, I'm a former psychiatrist, but a graduate of Wheaton College, raised thick in evangelical culture. And um, I left uh, the church 30 some years ago. It seemed way too small and conforming and indoctrinating and not in touch with reality as I experienced it. And then I left medicine and psychiatry about a decade ago for the same reasons. Uh, feeling a deeper call to really discover what the earth is and um, who am I really at the deepest level. And I've been, uh, I would call it a psycho-spiritual wilderness guide for the past eight years with Animus Valley and uh, Institute and also with some other ventures um, out here in Southern California where I live. Yeah, so... Um... One of the questions is is for, that we've been exploring is why is why is Seminary of the Wild needed for a time uh, such as this of you know in our age of uh, climate crisis and e ecological disaster and um, one of the things we've been exploring is is even the word seminary um, that you know um, I, when I went through seminary I had this deep sense of uh, of of grief in in early on in ministry that I I didn't actually learn um, the skills and the abilities whether it was spiritual formation or whether it was connecting you know to the natural world in a way that was fully alive and 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 fully human and fully appreciative of the diverse uh, the world and its its diversity but the word seminary uh, actually derives from uh, an older word, an old English word that that literally means wild seedbed. You know, it's this it's this wonderful idea that um, this even the word seed, you know, has this seminal this 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 latent potency of of potential and and experience um, that I I never received in seminary at all. I I had no clue. Um, like I said earlier, I had no clue what the world was and what, what my own place was in the world. And so um, Seminary of the Wild is really, in a sense, it's, it's a seminary in the truest and oldest sense of the word. It's this um, place of, of, of fomenting, of experience, of, of um, a cultivation of our deepest inner capacities, not, not only for wholeness, but for wildness, you know, for, for a, um, a, a remembering of why we are here uh, uh, on this earth, that our sense of, of God and theology is directly related to the ecology, you know, which is this, again, this household word, right? It's like Seminary of the Wild is in some ways maybe about learning how to return home and to how to belong. Yeah. And so... Um, uh, we, we've created these 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 four pillars and, and these different values that we've identified that that we're all in a, in alignment with and in our core to um, the process of uh, psycho spiritual growth and the process of leadership development that we're really about um, to help people um, not only cultivate their own wholeness but but become the leaders that they were were called you know, to become. Um, Maybe I can riff on that. I just want to share a little bit about the way uh, we use the word wild. Matt mentioned it a couple Please. times. And wild in our culture has a lot of different connotations. Sometimes it just means unhinged. Um, and that's not necessarily what we mean by it. Um, we mean by it maybe kind of the old, again, uh, derivation of it, which has more to do about um, that which is born that which is not conformist, that which is not indoctrinated, it's really internal. It's a unique authenticity. Just like every plant lives its wild life, um, it does that because it has it in its own DNA. So it's, and it's our understanding that in healthy cultures, there's a conversation between culture and the wild. When you need to find a gift to help the culture stay on track, People go out into the wild. There's pan-cultural rites of passage. They're all done in the wilderness. And there's a mystical encounter that usually happens that's brought back to culture that helps keep the culture from overusing its resources and bringing new gifts to it. 
something like that. So we're using the word wild in that sense that it's really uniquely authentic and designed maybe by mystery that it has a unique gift to give the world. So our set, our wild seed bed is also wild. It comes from the wild and it brings out the own wildness, our own uniqueness as a gift. The, the third sort of phrase within our title is of the, mm -hmm. this is not seminary in the wild, although it is. Um, so it is, it is reconnecting with the natural world, but it's also, it's a reciprocal relationship. It's not simply, you know, sort of like, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it, it's peaceful to be in, in nature. It's lovely to be in nature. It's good to, to even see the devastation of nature, um, to awaken us, but there's a sacred relationship that's been severed. And that affects both the way we treat the natural world and the way we see our and, and develop into being fully humans, to be fully human participants in a larger story, in a larger whole. And that doesn't get restored with, um, with thinking about it <laughs> and thinking about it different. Maybe that's the end result, but it, it's things change. People change. We change. The world changes out of relationship. And so if we can't, so it's, it's seminary of the wild, it's, it's of, um, it's restoring that sacred relationship and listening to uh, particular others in the natural world, you know, so it's not just listen to the trees and trees are all grow tall, you know, it's not like that. It's like this particular tree that I've developed an ongoing relationship with and I see how that tree you know, changes through the seasons, and I'm able to deepen into an actual relationship of love with this particular tree, awaken something in my soul and in the soul of humans that, that um, restores us into that um, interbeing that we say is so important, but you, you can talk about it and still live in that denial. But, but it's once you enter into that, um, you know, loving relationship and listen to, learn to really listen to trees and to really listen and give love back um, sounds sounds a little bit um, woo-woo until you actually do it. <laughs> and then it's like, wow, this feels familiar because this is uh, what it means to be human. And I think the, the praise there about doing it, I, when I think back to my seminary days, I was at Princeton Seminary. It was a very, very cerebral experience. I mean, it was all mm -hmm. about the mind and learning and developing constructs of the mind but there was very little sense of experience, right? Of what, how you actually interact with people, how you actually um, go out into the world and do this. It was, it was really, I think, primarily a more of a graduate school for theology than it was for practical help. So part of our commitment here is that we want to be a, a seminary that really trusts and values the experiential nature of, of the experience, that, that people have a chance to encounter nature to go into their own depths, um, to be able to find a way that their own inner wildness connects with the, the wildness of, of, of the divine and of the earth. There's a way that that happens in a way, integrates them through their experience. So it's, 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 prime, it's very much focused on the idea that you can trust your experience, that there's a sense of inner authority and transformation that really happens, especially through the body's involvement. Again, I mean, the body for me in seminary was pretty much as long as it got me to class you know, and, I, and I could use my hand to write a paper, that's all it needed. But this is something that trusts that uh, mm. heart, soul, mind, and strength or heart, soul, mind, and body are really integral to the experience. So I think we try to make sure that people have a sense of this being fully integrated in that, in that capacity of being fully human. Yeah, one of our uh, pillars is really rewilding, reclaiming the original and wild roots of the Christian story in what Brian just shared. You know, there's a sense of like, what is, what is the greatest command? What is the first command? What's the one thing, right? And Jesus says, you know, love the Lord, your God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, your whole vitality, your body, right? And love your neighbor, as your self um that reciprocal that sacred reciprocity is right there and I've, i i kind of feel like one of the questions 
uh, people are starting to ask, and, and one of the things that's integral for Seminary of the Wild is, who is my neighbor? And if my neighbor is, extends beyond the, the human world even to the more than human world, what does that look like to love our neighbor as ourself, you know? Um, clearly it means a lot more than thinking and speaking and voting and doing all these things that are important. It, it, it clearly involves this, um, this relationship, this, this capacity to fully feel and to be felt by the world. I think, yeah, I think part of my, my journey to this place was, um, you know, I got into ministry, as I said, 31 years ago, two years into it, I was ready to stop being a pastor. I felt like I was a hypocrite. I was a, a church professional, like I call it, somebody who knew how to run a storefront religious business in a sense. But inwardly, inwardly, I did not really understand about abundant life and peace that passes understanding. I, I felt like I was play acting at something. And so that mm -hmm. cracked me open, that pain and that longing and that dryness cracked me open and I got involved in spiritual direction. And that opened me up for the next 20 years and really a, a focus on the inner journey. Um, became really trained as a, as a practitioner, a lot of inner work. And then about 20 years ago, I got cracked open um, by the fact that my township where I live had no observance of Dr. King's holiday. And here in Detroit, I live in the most racially divided part of the country. And, and I was claimed internally to get involved with that. And that led me into becoming very committed to anti-racism work. And I began to realize that this journey inward always leads to a journey outward, engagement with the world. And, and so, and that led to being cracked open more about being aware, for example, of the way that patriarchy works and how that's connected as well to the destruction of our planet, the, the, how we treat, you know, how we oppress systems through our, our current structure destroys everything. So part of what I like about what we're doing is that I think some of the wild provides this integration of, say, of theology, ecology, psychology, which is the wild self, as well as then how do we bring this to the world? It's not just a place to sort of get more understanding, to be stimulated by more ideas. Ultimately, the, the bottom line is how do you bring this, these reclaimed theologies, ecology, and psychology in a way that serves the world? Um, and, of, and, and so you know, we, our final hope would be that people would go through this experience and then find a place to offer their own unique identity and service. It comes to the inner world, but is deeply in service and connection with what's happening in our planet and the outer world. Um, mm. So the integration for me is a big part of it, the transformation of us from being connoisseurs or, or people who, you know, just take in experiences and we don't then offer ourselves fully in love uh, to the world in the times that we're living in. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, one of the things that I would imagine somebody hearing you all speak who finds themselves allured to or drawn to or curious about what you're talking about is, you know, some of the practical details. So who is Seminary of the Wild for um, are there prerequisites that are prerequisites that are, you know, suggested, requested, required, or whatever, like what, just a little bit of the practical details. And then I'm going to invite each of you to share uh, more fully your story of how you, um, you know, <laughs> sort of your pre-doom, doom, and post-doom story. <laughs> how it goes up. Mm. Who's it for? Victoria, you want to tackle that one? Yeah. Yeah. It's for anyone whose heart is breaking mm. and they have a sense that of this doom, <laughs> but they're not sure how to integrate that with, with their faith tradition. Maybe they feel like the mm. only way through is out. And, um, mm. and so it's for those who are sort of standing on the edge of um, the cliff <laughs> Both, both as a religious institution and in their own spiritual journey and looking at culture and looking at, at the, the, the land and waters and trees and others and seeing something is happening and something is missing and something is amiss and I don't know what to do. 
Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's who this is for. And, you know, all of us can relate to that in a different way. Um, using the word seminary can help, you know, can sort of lead people to think, oh, well, I don't want to be a pastor. That's what seminaries are for. And so it's a little, um, you know, we have to spend some time explaining that that's not what we mean. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but it's, it, it provides a, a supportive community um, of others who are willing to look into the face of the fullness of life, which includes the darkness and the descent and the death. And so um, there's very few others in our, you know, in, especially for those who are in professional ministry, as Brian says, um, where it's dangerous to question these things and to, and to be honest with our fears and our questions and our and getting at that place. And so um, Seminary of the Wild is a, is a opportunity to, uh, the, the eco, we, have, we provide a, or we are offering a year long program that's called an eco ministry certificate um, that brings you through um, this integration of, of what we've identified as these four pillars that Brian um, sort of introduced as um, you know, psychology, ecology, and theology. and really spirituality and um, a lot of other things, but it brings you through a relationship with your relationship with the wild earth in your bioregion to get to know that as a, as a kin, you know, and learning from our, um, from those who lived in this land for, for, you know, generations for millennia, Uh, the indigenous, our indigenous brothers and sisters that, that have been so, um, uh, devastated by uh, our European cultures, um, but so that is part of the program as well. But that developing that enchanted, um, animate relationship with with the wild earth is is an important aspect. And so we spend uh, in the year long program we spend two and a half months of reading and discussing and. Um, be, and being given invitations to go out onto our own land and and develop those relationships and then coming back through this platform this zoom platform to have uh, you know councils together and listen deeply to one another um, and we'll bring in uh, you know people like you and those others that you are interviewing uh, for this for this podcast um, to to deepen into particular topics within each of these uh, what we're calling our four pillars. The second pillar is wild self, and how does uh, um, how how do, why does does the, all of the scriptures tell us of leader after leader from Moses to Jesus that go are called into wilderness? It's not just to say, oh, it's a tough time, you know, like I used to preach about. It's it's not just a metaphor. It's something real. There's a real reason that that people were sent into the actual wilderness for a. There's a relationship there that the wild animals and the angels that came to minister to Jesus in his 40 day, you know, wilderness vision fast, they were there to minister to him. There was some kind of, um, you know, life giving relationship there that's necessary for us to know our calling and our and to become a full leader and participant in what this evolving kingdom of God is, you know. So that deeper sense of wild self um, that's based a lot on the work of um, Bill Plotkin that uh, Brian can tell us a little bit more about. Um, but that um, nature-based soul work is, is what wild self is to deepen into that. And then it's the, you know, exploring, like Matt said, about what is this wild Christ? What is, what it, how are we... Um, entering into a deeper relationship with Christ through our deepening relationship with self and and the more than human others. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, theology that's been written over the last, you know, 30 years, but we're putting that into practice. And what does that actually look like in our, um, for for ourselves, we who are um, of this Christian faith tradition are um, our faith is part of our, our core identity. And so as we're making these questions, we can feel those little foundations crumbling and, and allowing that, you know, not being so scared of it. Like we got to stop it. It's that same post doom thing of how do we enter into that um, uh, grief and letting go of the foundations that we thought were holding up our faith and we're actually holding us back. 
And then it leads us into the wild call, which is what Brian was just talking about, about well, how are we going to use this to serve the world, the whole world, not just our little church community. Um, those days are over. Seminaries get it. Seminaries know and are seeing churches shutting down because it's such a bigger story. And so people are needing to um, have support in that. So we're not, we're not training people to become, you know, start your own, you know, semi of the wild or become a wild guide or whatever. We're, we're, we're supporting people to tap into who they are and who they are called to be in the world. Because there is that, if all of us were able to tap into that and really live into that, we could turn this around. What, what does that mean? You know? <laughs> doesn't mean we're going to stop uh, the crises from happening. No, <laughs> but we are going to be fully resourced and prepared and in connection and in community for what we're going to be called into over the next, you know, 20 years of our lives. Yeah. Wow. That was great. You know, I'm reminded of my conversation a few weeks ago with Daniel Thornson. Uh, Daniel is with uh, an organization up in upper Vermont called the, um, let's see if I get this right, the Monastic Academy for the Preservation of Life on Earth. Hmm. Whoa, how cool the is that? It's M-A-P-L-E, oh. Maple, the Monastic hmm. Academy for the Preservation of Life on Earth. Nice. And they practice a very sort of <clears throat> science, evidence-based form of meditation and ecological practice and all kinds of cool stuff. And so they really need to know about, in my opinion, they would do well to know about you all and you all about them. Yeah. It's, uh, it was really sweet in my conversation with him and uh, uh, doing sort of parallel track kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll follow That's up with great. Yeah. Very cool. So I want to invite each of you to share a little along the lines that uh, Matt already began doing, uh, which is more your personal story, your, your journey in how you sort of uh, grew up. I mean, not your entire life story, obviously, but you know, sort of your worldview growing up and how you uh, avoided doom, accepted doom and got to post doom and sort of what that even means for you. I was thinking back to my childhood where there was nothing spoken of doom except for doomsday mm. or Armageddon. That was way out there. One night, it might've been 1984, but it was probably way out there. Who knows, you might've been resurrected the day before doom. Something like that. So I would say, you know, partly my experience just comes from this privileged sense of being uh, raised white male, fairly mm -hmm. well-to-do family, not having many concerns and thriving actually in a conformist church and school system. I was really good at it and climbed the ladder quickly through college and medical school and academics and uh, got to a place where I kept sensing there needed to be something wilder, something more soulful. I kept using those words without really knowing what I was talking about. And then uh, eventually I was out, at, and when I was 21 actually, I was spending a lot of time in nature by myself, reading poetry, writing poetry, reading uh, The Hero's Journey, other Joseph Campbell works, wondering I don't know, do I want to be a pastor? Do I want to be a missionary like I'm expected to be? Or can I choose something else? I chose like a secular priest of being a psychiatrist. Mm. And then that wasn't enough either. And uh, one of the things that happened to me when I was on a first wild excursion is uh, I had a 24 hour solo. And on that solo, I uh, spent a lot of time in a tree that I called a grandfather because I never really had grandfathers that paid attention to me. And in the middle of that solo that night, I had a dream, vision, imaginal encounter of uh, an indigenous woman saying, welcome home. And I knew it was the earth welcoming me home. And I didn't know what to make of this because I'm a psychiatrist and I could have written a script for myself to get rid of these visions, but it felt integrated actually. And one of the things I noticed over the next couple of months is that I was really emotional. I could no longer conform to the way psychiatry expected me to behave and practice. But I also began to really pay attention more to what was happening globally in terms of um, species extinction, climate change. It was like the blinder was taken off a bit. And part of it was that I felt like I actually didn't belong primarily to my profession and certainly didn't belong to the church anymore. 
I belong primarily to the earth. And that kind mm. of shift of consciousness made me actually feel much more emotional about what was happening. I got it at the cognitive level before. I didn't get it at the emotional kind of gut, psychosomatic, spiritual level. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have Seminary of the Wild. And one of its um, core hopes is that by being in the wild and guided into certain practices, individuals might have this, what we call eco-awakening. It's coined again, used by Bill Plotkin, that we really discover that we primarily belong to earth. Culture, church, profession, those are all secondary identification. That might be an important reason why the mess we're in is that we've not identified primarily as uniquely created by earth and belonging to earth and earth is our mother, something like that, which goes a little bit against a lot of the way the Bible has been interpreted, something like that by different um, theologians. So that was part of my experience and it was really moving beyond, I guess you would call it denial. It was more emotional denial of what this might meant. And then I began realizing that most of this had happened in my lifetime. A lot of the significant, you know, it's been going on for 2000 years and you know, 200 years in terms of industrial society, but a lot of the uh, um, species extinctions and the loss of uh, certain ecologies were really in my lifetime since the mid sixties. And that began to break my heart, especially as I was bringing children into the world. Um, and then the more I, could feel the more I actually could let in and really realize where we might be actually. So along these times, I'm also totally disidentifying from my profession and really understanding that I was primarily here to rewild the rivers of soul for everyone and for our people um, and to get rid of dams and anything that might poison authenticity and wildness. I also was realizing, wow, it's not just that this is, I found my unique place in the world. I found my unique place in the world, but we're at a very unique time that maybe we've never seen before. Mm. And it's like, we're on this incredible um, barge. I used to live in new Orleans, right? And they have these guys who are really trained pilots for these barges because they take like 10 miles to turn properly. And it felt like this is what Western culture is and we can't turn it quick enough. Technology can't turn it quick enough. Technology might have some role in it, but most people who are coming up with technological ideas are actually don't even know what the earth is either. So they're really doing it from a patho-adolescent understanding of how we might change things. And then I really began to agree that as a collective, um, maybe we're doomed. Maybe it was wrong to bring children into the world. Maybe there's no reason to keep going. So kind of moving through the emotional denial and actually feeling some of the shock of what, especially my professions, medicine and the church, two of the things in my core background, how they've really participated in kind of keeping us from understanding or really changing Western culture. They've actually capitulated to Western culture. And then moving into a lot about the anger of why was I born in this time? <laughs> why couldn't my children be born in a different time and have an easy life? Uh, a, a fair amount of sadness because you couldn't actually feel it. It's too much mm -hmm. at times. Mm -hmm. And then finally coming to a place of just accepting grief as it is. This is a unique time. This is a time for grieving. We're in a culture that has avoided death for so long and a lot of death is coming. That leads further for me into just these questions that I raised earlier before we started talking about knowing what I know about who I am both as a psycho-spiritual guide, speaker, writer, um, system builder, and knowing the time we're in, and also my knowing my role as a parent and a partner, how then shall I live? It's really clarifying. It gets rid of <laughs> bullshit. You know, vacations are like, how do vacations really serve the maturation of my children and connect them to earth and their own authenticity? What gifts do I give them that actually help them prepare for the future and become who they are? It isn't about stuff anymore. It isn't about making them happen. It's about how do I help them prepare and serve in a unique time? So that's maybe the best way I can answer your question about um, pre-doom, doom, and uh, post-doom is partly I get the reality of where I'm at and I'm not giving up. 
I'm filled with hope. And when we're guiding Seminary of the Wild programs and people come back with amazing experiences in the wild, that gives me hope because we see the shift of consciousness and a beginning of a transformation of understanding, oh, that was actually wrong. This is how I understand the world. This thing just happened to me. I'm beginning to sense a different way in the world. I'm beginning to sense that I'm actually unique, actually. I might have my own unique calling and the earth herself is actually alive. I'm really excited about these things and these kind of experiences give me hope knowing that we're turning this great barge around, even though slowly. Uh, others who want to share uh, any aspect of your journey uh, in coming to where you find yourselves now? So my, my uh, facing doom moment was connected with my, with the work that I did with my son. Um, so, yeah, I wanted you to speak to that. Yeah, we, um, when he was 12, he watched um, Inconvenient Truth and was blown away by it and um, started, you know, sort of preaching in his what, seventh grade class that, uh, you know, the climate change was going to kill us all. <laughs> and we needed to, we needed to, you know, the kids needed to stop it. And, um, and so I had done work, you know, when I was pregnant with him, um, with uh, on trying to get evangelical churches to embrace the reality that their own worldview um, needed to include creation care basically and so that was that was sort of part of my past and I put all that away it's like all right this was just the thing I did and you know so it hadn't really penetrated uh, me emotionally and uh but once once this ignited in my son um i was compelled through a lot of a longer story to to just support that and we ended up starting a, a nonprofit organization that first was called kids versus global warming um and he started speaking being being a public speaker and ended up speaking to over a million people all over the world. Yeah, no, he was in very many ways uh, an early version or a, uh, in, this, in a similar vein, a similar direction as Greta became. Yeah, I think he was sort of a precursor and, and you know, started that road because at the yeah. time when he was so enlivened, I looked for another youth organization around climate and there wasn't one. And so we we're like, well, I guess we start this. And, what was um, this? What was year, year was this? Oh, Five, yeah, because yeah. 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 I remember, and so and so he, you know, would give these. His very first presentation was called the Five Flavors of Denial, Climate Denial, and he would like nail um, all. It just drove him insane. The the illogic of, um, you know, well, it's hot out today. It's you know, and um, and so the the climate deniers really. Um, pissed him off <laughs> mm -hmm. so but he but he was just like really um you know empowered to speak to you know that you know you your generation doesn't care about this because you'll be gone but really this is this is going to affect the the youngest generation that's alive now like we will be uh, the recipients of the worst of this and you know just like this uh, so we were the first ones to sue the the U.S. government, we sued every state um, with, with the folks that are continuing the, the lawsuit um, with, with another set of plaintiffs, but we got, plain. we had marches in 200 cities and, you know, so we did all of that um, activism. And when, and I was mostly just, you know, like running to keep up with my son. <laughs> and by the time he turned 16, um, he was in Iceland with National Geographic and he was standing on a glacier that he was told this glacier will be gone next year. And it began to, then he started reading Derek Jensen. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, he, and he began to reckon with the reality that there is, he actually has a TED talk um, that has that image, uh, Brian, that you mentioned about the barge and it was a boat that was about to go over a water, a waterfall. 
And so he was really working with that um, image and like, how do we, you know, it's too late to get the boat turned. Do we, do we just get everybody to jump off the boat and swim to shore, you know? And he didn't, um, so he was reckoning with it on a really deep level to the point where, um, and he went down to Ecuador to the, um, you know, rainforests and spoke with indigenous people there. And so, it was as his mom watching him and then and then my daughter four years younger than him would i remember was at a fundraising thing and she's just like i just want like to go to college and have a dog and become a writer i don't want to deal with this but you're forcing me to do it like i don't it's not fair so his, her message is actually more like greta's <laughs> Alex was much more sort of like, let's look at the big picture here and we can do this together. We can do this. It's like, we can. And um, once, once he got to college, he saw his, the, the, he went to college up in British Columbia to be in, in this old growth forest and was very deeply engaged with that forest and um, saw that forest be clear cut, you know, and it, it, it plummeted him to a very deep depression, um, an immobile one where he had to quit college, came home and just, you know, sort of like watching him hardly ever able to get out of bed and feeling the, the guilt actually that I still am wrestling with of like, I exposed and supported my son to open up to this depth of doom and reality. And I remember Jim Hansen and um, um, Bobby Kennedy were talking. Um, was it Bobby Kennedy? Robert Kennedy, anyway. Well, yeah. Um, we're talking when he, and you know, about Doom. And Alec walks up, this 14 year old kid, and they're like, stop, shh, here's Alec. You know, he's the youngest generation. He doesn't need to know this. And being at the Copenhagen thing in um, climate conference in, 2006 which was like this we're gonna change you know like a, an interviewer asked Alec like why are you the only one here who has hope it's because he was flipping 14 years old and he didn't know it yet and um anyway so my own guilt of like bringing my son into this and bringing other children into this uh through the the nonprofit that become I matter um was a, a, a reckoning of like, what are we doing, you know? And um, so just my own deep realization of what they're, what we've done and what they're in for. And the deer that come to my yard of what they're in for of, you know, it's just like, there's the, there's the reckoning. Yeah. And it's so connected with our own sense of denying our own mortality and, and the sense that we can as parents protect them is a lie. <laughs> we can protect them from any, you know, <sighs> and, um, and then being able to deepen into, you know, like this work in the, the Seminary of the Wild and this, this, this restoring sacred relationship, not just relationship that I care about this forest and so I'm going to protect it, but sacred relationship that my, my life, my wholeness, my purpose for being alive is connected with being deeply connected with, with all. Um, you know, so it's not about like when we invited you to Seminar of the Wild, Michael, we had, we actually had no idea what you were bringing <laughs> and we're, we're like shocked ourselves of like, oh my God, you know, so I've really been thinking about it since then and mm -hmm. how important that, that reckoning with the reality is to deepen us into a place of compassion. It is the way through that block of compassion I was talking about before is to is to see what's real and to actually grieve and not escape from the grief and there is an there is that that's the only resource to get in touch with the compassion that matt was talking about the the compassion that jesus was talking about of how to really love how to really love like 
what are we if we aren't if we aren't grounded in love and if we're so that's that's to me what what this work is now is yeah. is how to help people um, ground into love. You can't skip you can't skip Holy Saturday, and the grief of of the of the death of uh, Good Friday, and just skip over into yay resurrection like most of the church does. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, thank you for sharing all that. Uh, that was really great, and I'm, I really appreciate your tears. I shared it at the time. I know Brian. Uh, it needs to leave. Brian, anything you want to say uh, before you take off? No, I just look forward to hearing what the rest of you have to say when this gets posted. Mm. Sorry, I have to take off. Trust. Thanks, Brian. Thank you for the opportunity, Thanks, Michael. You're welcome. All Thank right, you, see you, Brian. I think for me, um, what came up to my mind for some reason when you asked that question, Michael, was I have been married for few years, my wife and I had got into an uh, argument, a conflict. And at the point in this, in this argument, she says to me at uh, one point, you know, I think, I think the issue is we both love the same person. And she was talking about me, right? That I was living a life of pretty much self-focus and um, kind of contained in, in my world. Like I wanted things in my world to be how I wanted them to be. I wanted everybody else around me to conform to what I was expecting and wanting her, my kids. And, um, <laughs> I realized, you know, now looking back, well, as a pretty well-educated white male, you know, uh, upper middle class, um, able-bodied, you know, heterosexual, that, that I was living in a world that was kind of formed for me in a sense. Like I was, yeah, this is the way it's supposed to be. Like this should revolve around me. Like this is, don't you see how this is set up? Like, don't you get it? Like this is, and if it doesn't conform to what I want, there's something wrong with that. Um, but her comment I think we both love the same person. Somehow got in and uh, like, wow, she's right. I mean, there's a sense of, yeah, that's true at some level. And um, and then it really blew up. I guess my pre-doom blew up it really in an anti-racism training where we were, where for three days, we were going through the wall of U.S. history. And, you know, we're looking at all the things that, that uh, American culture had done over these since really since since the colonists arrived to, to perpetuate this sense of white supremacy and i didn't know hardly any of it i mean i was i was i was like watching this wall of history go up going damn i this is what i've been living in i mean it was, it was I, I i say it's sort of like the, taking that red pill in the movie the matrix where it's like all of a sudden i was i am living in a construct that's when built to support me, and I had no idea like it was even going on. And and all of a sudden, you know, I realized there's this whole other reality that I have been blind to, like clueless to, in my privilege. That's that all of a sudden it's like being pulled down. I'm like, damn, so much destruction, so much um, inhumanity, so much violence, hatred, and and I remember feeling initially like this impulse to be defensive and like, you know, I don't want to feel this. Like this is bullshit. This can't be real. Okay. But again, kind of like with my wife's comment, like, no, I know this is real. I know this is happening. And, um, and that kind of cracked me open to like, I'm living in a world that has so much pain. Mm. Uh, not by accident, but by design. Like this was set up mm. by people to, to uh, benefit people just like me and it didn't just happen it happened very you know intentionally and systematically and um and so i was kind of living in this sense of wow feeling a lot of grief a lot of guilt um a lot of still self folks like so what do i do you know how do i as a white guy help to fix this problem and then when i went on the land uh, on a vision fast it really blew open when one night I'm out on my solo um, for four days fasting. And, and the first night, um, you know, I hear this sort of, I, I thought it was a drum beat. I, it was, I thought it was the, the, the guides at home camp you know, sending us their blessing, basically. But it kept going and going and going. And the middle of the night, I realized I wasn't hearing, a, I wasn't hearing a drum beat. I was hearing a heartbeat. And, um, the heartbeat of the land around me. And I realized that the land was, was sharing like something really 
personal and sacred with me. Like I was hearing it and almost instantly it led to this profound, um, this profound sense of grief, like, um, you know, the grief of the people, I think who had lived in that space. We were indigenous territory, the grief of the land itself, probably were what's experiencing now. And I just, I just spent, you know, the next couple of days basically sobbing, just feeling, letting myself feel into this grief that felt, um, just, I don't want to use you know, the word cosmic, but something that just felt profoundly deep and true about reality, I guess. There was this grief. Um, and, but then that gave way, like to this, a couple of days, you know, into that vision, that vision fast, there was a sense of, of something coming up in me and through me of blessing. Like, like it wasn't just a few grief. It was like, it was alchemical process. Like the grief was fueling a response that was being asked to me. And I recognized that the response that Victoria said was, was one of love ultimately. Like the only way to survive this for me felt like to trust in the power of love. And I wasn't sure what it was going to take me, what it was going to look like, what it was going to ask of me. But I remember, I just remember saying to love, it felt in a personified way somehow. I'm saying, I'm saying yes to you, wherever it takes me, whatever it asks of me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying yes to love. And I feel like for me, the journey of love, the invitation of love um, is for me what gives me hope that whatever comes, however it looks, but that reality will not, that love, the strongest reality that exists is not in danger. Mm -hmm. And so love is no longer self-focused, like I love me, or even just I love people, but like just saying yes to love and all of its fullness of vulnerability, open heartedness, um, just because love is, is, is inviting me and us to do that, that that is the way forward, have a look. So, so to love this world, open-heartedly to love other people you know there's a passage that i'm really been in my heart for a while it's you know it's in the ephesians that you may know how high and wide and long and deep is the love of christ and i would say the wild christ mm -hmm. that, that that knowing that is the greatest journey and i for me some of the wild is 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 a way for people theologically ecologically you know, psychologically and then through the gift to say yes to, to that love in a way that's full bodied and full hearted um, in a way that can offer that for what it is to the world. So it's not about saving anything. It's really more about saying yes to the single greatest reality that the, there is. Yeah. And for me, yeah. that is that is the hope of post doom is that love is still on the other side of, of doom. What is reality? And I guess what I'm saying for myself, at least where I'm at is, um, you know, in the Christian scripture that says all things are held together in Christ or in mystery. So reality for me is love. So if, if there was some other greater reality at the heart of everything than that, I don't know that I could be as hopeful as I am. Mm -hmm. So reality is not just what I see. It's, it's love. Love is the reality. So all, even everything you said to me is held in a larger container of love. So, um, yeah, and as I shared when I was there, and I've been doing a lot now, that for me, time is sacred. Time is a dimension of the divine, that the past mm -hmm. is the creator. The present is the Holy Spirit, and the future, right. any hope of redemption is making the future our Lord. That is the future, our guiding principle for how we live. So mm -hmm. for me, having a sacred relationship to the past, to the future, and to the present is not believing in the Trinity, it's experiencing the Trinity right. every yeah. breath. I breathe in atoms in the past, I hold that. I breathe out atoms in the future that go on into the future. And so I commune with the Trinity. I commune with the three in one persons of reality. Um, and love is an intimate, love is an intricate, intimate and integral aspect of reality. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the ways I think of about time too, is just in relationship to memory and in relationship to place you know, that uh, time has some strange sacred connection to place as well. Um, and, and in this conversation, like through the stories of Victoria and Brian, <clears throat> I just, 
just noticing a lot of grief coming up, just, just talking about it, just hearing your stories. Mm-hmm. And the, the, this, this question of doom, this image of, of doom, what comes up, what's been coming up for me lately is, um, is the Amazon. And, um, it's like, it's like a crying. It's like, um, it's like, I, I just feel it in my cells, you know? And, uh, I know that the Amazon functions like a, like the heart, right? The heart of the world. <laughs> more like, Quite, more like the lungs. Or probably. the lungs, you know, the lungs or the heart, this great vast being. And, um, and the sense of it burning and, um, and the curiosity, if this is what the world is, what, what is the world saying? (laughs) And, and, uh, that sense of, of, of love, I would say my, my journey from, the doom journey, you know, through denial and, and I guess you could say resurrection. It's the denial is really rooted in, in not feeling. Yeah. Not feeling. Yeah. Not feeling, not feeling what I am, not feeling what the earth is, not feeling, not allowing the world to feel me not allowing the world to feel us fully and and the this that phrase from david white you know keeps popping up in my head too you know we're that one terrible part of creation privileged to refuse our flowering and i feel like that is one of the greatest poetic definitions of sin you know of of hatav missing the mark um and and one of the most um, heartbreaking. And I, I feel like my whole life, you know, all through childhood, since I was a kid, I felt out of place. <laughs> you know, like, I, uh, I felt like something was wrong, something was off, and I could never put my finger on it. And I don't know if it's just how I was wired, but I always had this this longing that I was aware of that was never, never fulfilled. Um, Feeling like an exile, that sort of thing. And I realize now, you know, my, my way of denial through most of my life, most of my, especially my younger years was either the rebel or, um, you know, this, this escapist needing to, to, to turn off the valve because I was afraid, uh, I was afraid to feel. I felt like it would be so much that it would completely undo me and I wouldn't be able to function or survive in this world, you know? Um, and so I think part the, the image that comes up in this precipice of, of doom and, and post doom is, um, is a tree. And and for me, the tree, um, is, is, is this universal image, um, this archetype, this, you know, something that, um, comes up from the unconscious, these, these deep, deep layers, even beyond, human in some ways and it shows up in all the world myths and um but it's this that tree of life you know that that world tree um and it it's shown up in my dreams and um is this great white tree in the middle of this this forest with a river running out of the middle of it 
Um, and for some reason, this particular image has held my grief uh, over the last few years um, and helped me help me understand my relationship to the world in a very clear way. Um, on my quest on, on this, you know, vision fast uh, five years ago or something, uh, when I was on my solo, um, one of my ways I started to tell my old story <laughs> was to uh, embody it by building this, um, what's it called, a little, um, to, uh, to, I forgot the word for it, but I built this little replica of the woods behind my house as a child. A little model built, or? Yeah, like a little model. And I built it out of these sticks that had moss on it. And when I was a kid, uh, partially to avoid um, a home where I didn't feel like I was seen or understood <laughs> and partially because of uh, this, that adventure, sort of this, you know, this uh, longing that I have had, I would spend hours exploring the woods behind my, my house and uh, climbing on these logs, you know, these, these fallen trees covered in moss. And I have these distinct memories of, of um, the atmosphere on my skin and the sun coming through the upper canopy and the, the damp kind of stink of the rotting leaves and all these mm -hmm. really visceral memories. And um, this, this image of this, uh, the, this little patch of ferns kind of glimmering in the sun kind of shivering. And um, I had this, this sense that the woods behind my house uh, was, was my real birthplace in some ways. For more information about this project, go to postdoom.com.